Now very often people tend to use a larger catheter when there's bypassing. And actually that's the wrong thing to do. Because if there's bypassing in a catheter, very often it's appropriate to use a smaller catheter. Because the urethra is not actually round, it's more <coughs> this sort of shape. So if a particular size catheter is bypassing, suppose that this is the size of catheter in here, and urine is running out here by the sides of the catheter, there is catheter bypass, then very often what people do is put in a larger catheter, thinking that the larger catheter will take up more of the urethra, therefore not bypass. But in actual fact the opposite is true. The larger the catheter, we have a larger catheter here for example, then that will not allow the urethra to lie in a physiologically closed position. It will increase the size of these gaps here. Therefore might make bypassing more likely. Whereas if a smaller catheter is used, It will allow the urethra to lie in its more physiologically closed position. I haven't drawn that very well. So, so normally the urethra would be closed fairly flat like that. The larger the catheter, the more it's going to distort the shape of it. The smaller the catheter, the more it allows, to lie, it allows the urethra to lie in its physiologically closed position. So if your patient's catheter is bypassing, then very often that bypassing can be treated by changing it for a smaller catheter, not a larger one. So larger catheters are associated with a greater incidence of complications, even obstructions and bypassing, as we've said, than smaller ones. I tried to keep catheter size down to 12, 14, or at largest, 16. Another common problem I've come across with uh, patients that are catheterized is that two large balloons are used. Five to ten mils of water only should be used in the balloon. And catheters which require 30 mils of water for the balloon should be kept again for uh, post-surgical use. So for routine uh, drainage of urine in the ward-based or the home-based situation use a 12, 14 or 16 catheter with 5 to 10 mils of water in the balloon not the larger catheters not the larger balloon volumes. Let's go on now and think about how we're going to manage the catheter once it's in place. What are the aims of management? Well, principally, the aim is to have an uninterrupted flow of urine. That is the objective. If the urine is stagnant in the bladder, of course, it will tend to become infected. And of course, we want to minimize or prevent any complications associated with the procedure itself. We're now thinking about the management of the catheter and the drainage system once the catheter is in place. In place. We want to prevent the urine becoming concentrated and precipitating by the individual drinking at least two litres of fluid a day. This will keep the catheter and the catheter tubes flushed out with fresh urine. We want to minimize the length of the catheter in the drainage tube, so use a female catheter for females, and prevent the tubes from kinking, again to ensure an even flow. The collection bag should be kept low to prevent urine from the collection bag or the catheter tubing draining back into the bladder, carrying infection back in 
with it. Very often in the past, bladder washouts have been carried out for ritualistic reasons. So we should only do these if there is a specific indication for it, such as catheter blockage. The system should be kept closed. All the parts of the system should be closed to prevent urine getting into the system and infection ascending through the lumen of the catheter. What we're going to do now is run through the whole procedure in a simulated situation. Practice. Now clearly the technique must be aseptic. Asepsis is vital. We do not want to introduce any infection into the bladder. And as I go through this procedure, what I want you to do is, is watch, keep a check on, on me, and make sure that there's nothing that I'm doing that breaches principles of asepsis that could possibly cause any contamination. So asepsis, absolutely vital. This is a sterile procedure. Second principle of safe practice is don't force the catheter in. If you come to a blockage or an obstruction, don't force it through. You should get some resistance from the urethra, but it should be even and equal. So if you come across a blockage, don't force it. You could do a lot of damage. The urethra is a very delicate structure and can be damaged really quite easily. So if there's any obstruction, get an experienced practitioner or preferably someone with some surgical experience to pass the catheter for you. The third principle, <clears throat> as we'll see this clearly later, is we're going to blow a balloon up. And it's absolutely essential to ensure that the balloon is in the bladder cavity before it's inflated. If the balloon is inflated in the urethra, it can do a lot of damage. And the fourth thing at the end of the procedure is to make sure that the foreskin is returned to a normal physiological position. If the foreskin is left retracted, it will become inflamed and that will result in a paraphimosis. So bear in mind these principles, asepsis, no forcing, ensure the position is correct and leave the patient comfortable at the end of the procedure. Now just before we start, there's one point of anatomy I want to clarify. So if we look at this diagram over here, we're looking at a simple line diagram. <clears throat> here we have the bladder, the urethra, the penis, scrotum, the rectum uh, at the back there. And we can see here that <clears throat> as the urethra works its way into the bladder, and incidentally the male urethra is 19 to 20 centimetres long, whereas the female urethra is only four centimetres long. And it first goes round a bend that way, then round a bend that way. So if you attempt to pass the catheter with the penis pointing down towards the feet, it must go round that bend and then round another bend. And you're making it go a sort of S-shaped, but uh, via an S-shaped path. So we want to avoid this. What we want to do is minimise the amount of turns that the catheter must make to get into the bladder. So what we do is, if we go into this diagram, is we hold the penis at 90 degrees, maybe a little towards the erect position. Hold it at least away from the body, like that. And when we do that, that straightens out this bend, and it means the catheter must only go around this one bend to gain access to the bladder. So during the simulation, you'll see me holding the penis up away from the body at 90 degrees or even slightly towards the erect position to minimise the amount of bends that the catheter must go through to get into the bladder. Let's now uh, go on and carry out the procedure in a simulated situation. What I've done for the purpose of this uh, demonstration is I've arranged the things I'm going to need here on this table. Now very often if you had a, a double shelf trolley, you would, this would be the bottom shelf of your trolley. So what I've done is, as with any procedure, I've gone through what the stages of the procedure in my head and got out everything that I'm going to need for it. The other table here is going to be my sterile field and uh, that would very often be the top of your trolley if you're using a double deck trolley. Now you can do this procedure on your own or with a dirty.